We are going to hear from digital natives and tech skeptics, Tamara Sniad, Kyle Harris, and Laura Zelia uh, from Temple University. And they're going to offer their experiences and offer recommendations on learning technologies using courses at three different colleges and schools at Temple. So, um, Tamara is first. I'm gonna go first. Yes. yes. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. I am impressed. Look at look at the size of this group for a nine o'clock in the morning presentation on the second day of a conference. So thank you so much for for being here um, and joining us this morning. So we um, so the three of us actually are at Temple University and we um, we met each other through this teaching with technology um, roundtable that was created really to try to bring people from across the university to think about how do you bring more technology, and not just more technology for the sake of technology, but meaningfully engaging technology in, um, in the college classroom. So I'm with the College of Education, and Laura is with the communications, the media, and Kyle is with public oh, health. Public health. health. So, so we have a nice, um, a nice um, blend of different content areas. So I, um, I got involved with the teaching of technology because I'm in the College of Education, and quite frankly, there's not a whole lot of teaching with technology going on in the College of Education. Um, and so it was something that I um, got kind of interested in, um, really just through my experience working with, um, with uh, pre-service teachers and hearing from them how challenging it is for them to go through the College of Education and then go out to the, their classrooms and not know how to use the smart board that is in every Philadelphia classroom out there. Not know how to use technology in meaningful ways and, um, and not know how to use data. So I started using more technology in my classroom. I also was inspired by my children's uh, first grade teacher. So I have a third grader and a fourth grader. And in their, both of them had the same first grade teacher. And that first grade teacher just used technology in a way that brought my older child, um, his learning just, he just he just thrived in that classroom. He was just so engaged and he learned. His academically, he really improved. And I, and I have not seen that kind of spark in him, actually, in the years following because I've seen less technology being used. So I want to make sure that the students that graduate from my class and my, our programs are really well equipped to use technology. So, and also in my college started um, offering workshops and for faculty trying to you know get the conversation going and talking about it. By the way, my area is um, teaching English as a second language. So I am not a technology specialist. I talk, start off uh, every presentation I've done on technology by um, admitting that um, at my I, that in my master's program back in the late 90s. In my master's program, and I just remember sitting in the computer lab, sobbing my eyes out in the computer lab because I had some kind of tech-related assignment that I had to do. Um, I, um, when I just defended my dissertation in the in 2003, I defended my dissertation. I refused to use PowerPoint. How long was PowerPoint out by that point? Okay, so I was not a gung-ho technology user. I was really pretty reluctant, but. I feel that it's just so important for our students to have those skills um, that I have really forced myself outside of my comfort zone. So this clicker's not working, so I'm just going to advance this way. So how many, has, has anyone familiar with polls everywhere? All right, fantastic. So for those of you who are and those of you who are not, you are going to need your cell phone for this portion of, um, the, of our, our time together. So um, I, in my classrooms, I, I don't have a technology policy. So some, uh, some, I know some faculty have a no phone policy, no laptops. They want to make sure that they keep students' attention. Um, I believe that if students start pulling out their phones and playing with their phones, that is a cue to me to step up my game. So um, I, uh, so I either make use of the cell phones or I use that as a gauge of how engaged, how engaged my students are with what we're doing in the classroom. So, um, you know, how, um, so how, so how many of the following do you use? Word processor, PowerPoint, Twitter, Facebook, eBook, YouTube, BBR. Do you, how many of you use all of those? Okay. Um, how about, um, how about almost all? Okay. How about half? Okay. How about none? 
All right. Wow, look at this. A room full of technology users. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, so polls everywhere, um, just so, and I will, I, I can talk, I'll talk you through this a little bit. Um, it's a way for us to connect um, with our students, and it can be a large group, you can use a small group, you have your phone, and what it will do is, is give you a, um, a, a number where you text to that number, and then you type your, and then you text your answer. And then it pulls it together and, and graphically will represent the responses from everybody who's participating. Um, now, not everyone has a cell phone, and some people have cell phones that, um, that, that uh, charge per text message. Mm -hmm. So, laptops. So they also have the alternative that you can use a laptop or a computer. And most universities will have some kind of borrowing opportunity for laptops. So there really should be a way for every person in your classroom to participate in that. Um, and so here, I, so the first one was an example of a multiple choice. Here's an example of how I could get um, responses that are more open-ended. And what, will ha what would happen on this is each individual answer will show up as a bubble. And so you'll be able to see people's answers. So I'm going to just ask, and you know, go again old-fashioned. Um, why did you first? Uh, why did you first learn how to use those technologies? Remember, there are microwaves and um, uh, PowerPoints. <laughs> and why did you start using those? Yes. I feel I would be remiss if I didn't use them. Okay. The students are going out to teach. The students they're teaching, they use it. They use it. Right. So there's a, a sense of responsibility that we know that it has to be done. All right. What else? Yeah. Um, the first time I used PowerPoint was the first time I used teach a large lecture. Uh, I was like, ah, I don't know how to do this. But yes. So you had to. I had to do it for a job. I took a job where I was doing a, a professional development, and my job required that I had to learn how to do it. So sometimes. So sometimes it's because you feel responsibility. Sometimes you feel because you have you have to. Um, so um, so there's lots of reasons why people start. Then my next question was going to be why do you continue? And so a lot of times we continue because you find it convenient. Woo! I, I can't imagine going through my day without using my microwave at least once a day. Okay, love that popcorn. Right? I know it's bad for you. I know. I know. But it's so good. Um, and so you do it because you keep doing it because it's it feels right. Now there is lots of technologies that I've tried in my classroom that I just found just didn't really add. There's no value added. Um, I tried Symbaloo, which just didn't really quite work for me. It worked for some people. Um, and so there are things that you just kind of um, move away from. So um, these are all different types of technology that I've used in my classroom. So I'm just going to show you um, two of them that will just make your life so much easier. And they're communication tools. And I'm going to leave the engagement tools for my colleagues here. We'll talk a little bit more about polls everywhere and those types of um, engagement tools. So the first one is, um, is Remind. So Remind used to be called Remind 101. Is anyone familiar with Remind? A couple people. All right. This is lovely. Um, what Remind is is a, um, is a one-way text message that you send to your students. So you can, you act, so students will sign up, that you, you are given a page with a, a code for them to text. It signs them up for your class. And then on, online, on the website, you type in a message and it sends to the students. Now it's not the same thing as a group text. And I've been stuck on those group texts where you just keep getting binged as everybody responds about whether or not they can attend some social event, right? <laughs> it's not like that. This is one way and students cannot respond. So it's a very quick and easy way to communicate like, hey, don't forget we have a quiz coming up. Or please make sure to bring your textbook on this day. We're going to be using it or whatever. It's just a very quick way to keep that. Because the students, um, I don't know about you, but my students don't always open my emails. Okay, So texting is a way to kind of get that message out. Um, and they really, you know, it, and students can opt in. So not everyone would have to get it, but that's something that I really recommend. So it's called Remind. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the time to show you how to set up Remind, but this is the website. So if you want to write it down, it's https www.remind.com. And it's very, very self-explanatory. Free, um, you sign up, and you set up a class. And students opt in, and that is a very lovely way to communicate. The other thing that I highly recommend, and I don't care if I go over because this is so worth the time <laughs> to talk about, 
is youcanbook.me. Is anyone familiar with YouCan? Okay. Life changing, right? I mean, it just, I can't, I, I don't know what I do in the free time I have now that I <laughs> have this. It's, um, it's, a, it's a way for students to sign up for your office time. So, we have a lot of non-traditional students at Temple. I, you know, I set up office hours, you know, for a couple hours in the middle of the day, in the traditional where I sit in my office and wait, you know, with my door open and wait for them to come. Um, and what inevitably happens is I get absolutely nobody. Some say my office, I'm getting work done. You know, it's not, it's fine. But nobody comes, or I get an onslaught of, you know, 12 people there who who want to talk to me. And so what this allows people to do is sign up for time to talk to you in your office. I mean, you know, or the phone or WebEx or however you, you have your office hours. So the website, um, the benefits is, you know, I, so what I do is I, it hooks up, by the way, to your Google Calendar. So if you have Google Calendar, what, it, what this does is it will, it will look at your Google Calendar and you say, okay, so for example, for me, I only want to be, I only want to meet with students um, Tuesday through Thursday. And I get, and so well, that's when I'm on campus, and I have time when I'm doing my classes. I have time for meetings, and those things kind of get those things get blocked out automatically. So when students go to the You Can Book Me website, um, and this I can. Oh, so my, my office hours, so you can't book me now. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, but uh, what you would see, this is like, this is a great example of how you just keep, what? I'm very busy. I'm here today. No. Um, so, what would happen is there are columns here for Monday through Thursday, or, Monday, or Tuesday through Thursday, and it has, and I put 10 minutes to 10 slots, because I feel like it should take more than 10 minutes to answer a question. And if it does, they can block out two together. Um, and so I have those 10 minute time slots, and students will click on one of those, and they'll give me their name. I always ask what they're meeting me about, because I also do field, I do a lot of different things at the university. So they put in what they're meeting me for, and they hit submit. It, immediate, it automatically goes onto my calendar. So it blocks out that time, goes on my calendar, lets me know who's coming, um, and then it also will send me an email alert to say, hey, someone just signed up, and it sends something to the student. So there you go. So none of the, hey, I can't come to your regular office hours. Can you meet on Tuesday at 3 o'clock? No, I can't. How about Tuesday at 2 o'clock? Well, how about what? none of those back and forth? This eliminates it. What it also does is I can see a student has booked me for a time, and let's say a meeting comes up that I wasn't expecting. I see the student was planning to come. I can attend. Contact the student, let them know that I need to change, you know, and so on. Um, it also allows students to just cancel. So if they decide that they're not going to come or something's come, whatever, they can just cancel it. So they don't need to contact me to let me know that they can't come. They just can go on the site and cancel it themselves. Isn't that lovely? It was worth the time, right? Really worth the time. So I recommend that you check these few things out. Really useful tools for the for the classroom, and I'm going to pass the the um, the time over to Kyle. Thank you so much. Good. Yeah, I was looking for my coffee. I don't know. Oh, there it is. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay. So good morning again, to everybody. Uh, as we kind of were introduced and and. What uh, Tamara was kind of talking about here a little bit is the idea that one of the things I think makes this session unique to us is that we come from very different areas. Uh, how big is your largest class? Uh, 35. Okay. Um, my biggest, and I only teach two, is about 550. Wow. Natural, right? Big stadium seated. I got to put the microphone on. I did the whole dog and pony show. Um, so, to give you a little background about me and, and how we got to Top Hat, is that I got put on the Teaching with Technology Roundtable uh, because I have this very large class and inherited this class that was a very traditional hour and 30 minute, we're going to talk about anatomy and physiology, you're going to sit and listen, I'm going to show you pictures, and then I'm going to dismiss you. When I took over as the uh, Human Anatomy Coordinator in the College of Public Health, uh, that wasn't really flying for me. 
Uh, it's not how I teach. Um, and so what I needed to do is find ways to start to involve students, engage them a little bit more, because frankly, a lot of the material that I cover is dry stuff. Right? It's identification. It's there. It's this bone. Here's this bump. This is what this muscle does. Right? Not exciting stuff. <clears throat> so I really quickly started turning to the different types of technology uh, to, to engage these students and try to kind of bring them in a little bit. So what I found and what I chose to kind of use specifically was Top Hat, which is an in-class text response system. Very similar to Pulse Everywhere. I just happen to like Top Hat a little bit better. Top Hat also let me enroll a class of 550. Um, it is a web-based software. I use it for my presentations. I have my students with their phones out. So again, there's a little issue here where it comes up where we have students with phones out. Uh, they can follow along on my PowerPoint with their on their phone or on their iPad or on their computer. And I embed questions throughout my lecture. I never lecture for more than 10 minutes at a time. <coughs> After about 10 minutes or so, I'm losing people. And I know that because I sat through anatomy. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have my phone at the, a phone like that at the time, but it was, but I was getting lost. Uh, so about every 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, questions will pop up. They range from multiple choice. They range to discussion boards. They can be click on a picture to identify. There's some really cool options that we have with Top Hat. So there's a lot of comparisons. There's also a big comparison to Clicker, Turning Point Technologies. Does anybody use Clicker? Uh, can I just? Randomly, as I'm changing slides, what was your kind of experience with that? Do you still use clickers? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, it was. It's been a great way to mm -hmm. keep students involved, um, but also to allow them to answer some questions anonymously. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that was a big thing for me. Was with a class large, and I do a lot of what I just did, right? Like, mm -hmm. hey, what do you think about this, or what's this mean? And in 550 students sitting in a group, nobody wants to raise their hand and answer. So um, here was my problem. Uh, I teach kinesiology 1223 and 1224, which is our anatomy one and anatomy two. Um, we've increased our enrollment now. Uh, we've had about 900. Specifically this past year, we had about 1,100. And by fall, we're probably going to be looking at about 1,500 a semester with some new lab spaces that we're going to get, which we're really excited about. Most of my class are incoming freshmen. There's no prerequisite on my class. They are coming out of high school, and here you go. And it's also really content heavy, and I mean, this is the first class that they need. We're getting pre-med, pre-PT, pre-OT. I mean, we are teaching some of these students that this is the basis of everything, a lot of nursing students. So really, not only do they need to be there and involved, they really need to leave with a very good basic understanding. They're expected to. I also teach a class that any person in the College of Public Health must take. That includes public health, who will never, ever be clinical a lot of clinical professions. I'm an athletic trainer by trade. So I have to serve a bunch of different masters. This all creates different problems, right? I can't use one system that works really well with clinical preceptors if I have public health who are going to be interested in research. Uh, we also have a split right now. So my lecture is two days a week, and then they also have a lab that is separate that I do not teach. So this is my situation. It is not everyone in here. Does anyone else take a lab-based class, just out of curiosity? Okay, cool. So we have a, we have a, a few. Um, it, I can't treat it as a 30-person in-class discussion based. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, you're shaking your head, right, right? It just does not work that way. So Top Hat was my answer. It might not be for you. I, and I want you guys to understand as I go forward that if it's not, that's fine too. So the factors that I really needed to think about. Um, Again, no prerequisites means I have students that are juniors and seniors in the College of Science and Technology. I've had electrical engineering. Uh, I've had students that have come from a community college or an inner city high school with uh, the minimal GPA needed to get into Temple University. So things like smartphones are, are not within their reach. So I had to find something that really bridged this really wide gap. I also had to think about it the ease of enrollment, which is a serious issue for me. For that many students, I cannot sit and input names into a system. That just ain't happening. And then uh, there's a lot of changes that, again, that I'm trying to make to this class. So I had to be cognizant that I needed something that was adaptable and would kind of work with me. And what really opened the floodgates was a program that we held at Temple University called SOAR, which stands for Student-Oriented Active Redesign. 
it was a uh, uh, kind of a crash course over the summer where we took the classes in, with large enrollments or other issues and we went through the entire summer session and we redesigned the class to make it as student oriented as possible. Our Center for the Advancement of Teaching, or CAT, which I think is ridiculous. <laughs> right? Like, everyone's like, I'm going to go to the CAT. Like, they just sound strange. Uh, they were really, they're fantastic at Temple University and they really helped a lot. So, I, I'm a strong advocate. If you have at your university or institution something similar, seek them out. Because I struggled for about a year trying to decide between polls everywhere and top hat and all these, I just couldn't pull the trigger. And they made me do it, which was really nice. So, again, here are my issues. Here's how top hat fixed my issues. So, content intensive. I need identification questions. I need to know with a cl large class if they have questions or issues that they're having. And I also need to know where content wise are they where I need them to be. So what really was great about Top Hat was that the different question types that they have, as well as an unlimited number of questions per presentation, uh, I can throw them in on a whim if I need to. Sometimes that will happen where I realize the students aren't where I need them to be. So I stop real quick, I throw another question up just to try to get them over the hump. So I have a lot of different majors, a lot of different programs. So this is similar to polls everywhere where um, Temple University has a, a really good um, relationship with polls everywhere, uh, and as well as Turning Point Technologies. I'm pilot testing Top Hat, so this is hopefully something that we're going to look at getting a um, like a subscription university wide. Ease, ease of enrollment. Everything is done through email, and I copy and paste my email list at the beginning of every semester. <laughs> Sends them an email, and I'm done. It's uh, it also is really has been beneficial as as I have students add and drop classes in the first couple weeks. Uh, I can upload my entire course roster again, and it will only email students that have added or dropped or have gotten that email. You know. Uh, and then the changes that I wanted to make. Each semester is logged independently on Top Hat, which makes it really easy to transport everything from last semester to the other. <laughs> so as we did this, how I use Top Hat in my class is I use it in lecture as a review, which is really, really nice, but I've also used it to take attendance with a class of 500 students. Every class, this pops up at the very beginning and people take out their phones and they type in a random code. That code changes every time I open attendance. You got to be in class to see it. I leave it open for two or three minutes and I close it down. I've also gotten the habit now of taking attendance at the end of class, so as I see people get up and sneak out the back door, I just throw it up there again, which has also been really helpful. It's also been, the top hat has also been fantastic in closing lectures. Closing lectures meaning, um, at the end of the class I might ask you questions, I might ask, hey, here's three questions that if you paid attention today, you should know. Did you get those three questions right? If you didn't, that's a signal that we need to change something. So the analytics have been really helpful with this as well. Uh, a little bit small print, but you don't need to see the questions as much. Um, I use the analytics during class in a couple of different ways. First, I can ask a random multiple choice question. I do use some of my own exam questions. The students are told up front at the beginning of the semester, you're going to get 100 questions this semester. You might see five or six. Be prepared. Okay, so it gives them a little bit of an incentive. What I've done now is not just, hey, answer this question, here's the answer, let's move on. We can kind of do the more active learning. So a lot of times what I like to do is I like to ask a question. So I ask the question, right? You're driving down the road, and I'm trying to get to the idea of a, the adrenaline response or flight, fight or flight response. I said, what type of stimulation from this situation causes this feeling? And uh, instead of opening up the correct answer, I've opened up how many students have answered what answer. This gives them a chance to think about it and say, wait a second, right? Here's my really my three answer choices. Probably not humoral. Mm -hmm. Somewhere here. And I can reopen the question. So what this does is now lets a student evaluate what they just did and now go back and say, wait a second, okay, I really thought it was this neural thing, am I right? Well, now I've limited the answers for them a little bit more. They have a chance to really kind of delve a little deeper. Um, 
from a instructor side, not just the in-class side, the analytics have been great because I get a chance to pull up attendance in terms of percentages. I also get to pull up two stats. One is how often do they participate percentage-wise, and then how often of that percentage-wise do they get correct, which has been really great because I've had students at the end of the semester say, but Mr. Harris, I'm only a tenth of a point away, and I pull up their top hat, and they participated 75% of the time, but they have 9% correctness throughout the semester. Never sought help, never used that as a, as a red flag, and that's what we try to get them to do. You can also compare questions uh, within different, uh, within the same lecture, within different lectures, which has been super helpful. Um, the other side of the coin, and I have a four-year-old, so uh, we've done a lot of Spider-Man lately, right? With great power comes great responsibility. I can't control what some students say, right? I said, hey, what questions do you have from chapter one? We just finished up a great discussion. Somebody wrote Harambe, right? <laughs> Not really a question. <laughs> so uh, you have to be prepared if you're going to use some of these technologies to really be aware of how this is going to work. I asked them to click on the pituitary gland, right, in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> so when this pops up in the middle of my lecture, we have to really be aware of how we're going to do this. So as we kind of finish up with this, I use a handful of other things. Uh, I would encourage you to look at this, but I would also encourage you um, that one size does not fit all and one tool does not fix everything. Uh, thanks to teaching technology, I actually was sending a remind as we were talking about it because I canceled my class for today to be here. So um, I had to say, hey, real quick, make sure you don't show up. <laughs> so there's some other things uh, that I use as well, and, and I would encourage you to look at that kind of blended approach. Um, I think that's what is kind of the most beneficial. But uh, yeah, it's it's a fantastic tool, and, and I look forward to taking some questions afterwards. But at this point, I want to kind of hand it over to, to Laura. All right, please. Have your... Particularly a program called Nearpod. Anybody use it? Nearpod? No. Okay, so yes, two, two. Awesome. awesome. I use different tools for um, classroom engagement, and in, for technology for conversation in the classroom. I have used Twitter a lot, Pull Everywhere a little bit. I tried Top Hat, but I had a much smaller class, so it was a totally different experience. And now Nearpod. Um, I mostly teach production courses. I teach in the School of Media and Communication, um, teaching. Video production, critical making, uh, we're starting to do a little bit of 360 video, it's a mobile media class. It's like hands-on, making stuff, producing and directing, video editing, this sort of stuff. So again, that's why I love presenting um, with my colleagues because we do such different things. Um, so I'm going to talk about Nearpod now and how I've used it in the context of video production, video editing, and this type of class. So this is my outline. Um, what it is, how I've used it, recommendations, and then questions for any of the three of us. So Nearpod is a platform that allows me to easily type my PowerPoint <coughs> presentation onto my students' phones and devices. As you can see, it's free and it's fast, um, and we're all using it. And that took about, well, it would have been a little smoother if I would kept the code myself. So <laughs> under three minutes, it's pretty quick. Um, so I built in a question for you. How cool is this? Very cool or um, not that cool? If you could choose um, not that cool, I'll feel really good. So. <laughs> Okay, and then I can see um, over here where we're at and share the results. So um, we are overall 87.5%. That's pretty good. Um, we're overall feeling good about this. Unshare. Um, and I have one more question for you. Um, have you used classroom engagement technology before? Looks like we have right way up here. Um, so this is kind of a big one, but you can go ahead and put in an answer anyway. You could write anything, but I really just want to show you how this works. So, all right. So I'm going to share this answer. Yes. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> wrote this. Perfect. 
I was actually exactly what I'm looking for. Um, so what is Nearpod? You can do quizzes and polls, open-ended questions in many ways. It's very similar to Top Hat, but we can talk about some of the differences. Um, but it is very, it does a similar thing. Um, so the good news, it's free for up to 30 people at a time. You don't need logins. You, everyone in here can use it. Some people are already were using it, some people not. Um, but it's pretty easy to, to get started. That's for limited storage, but honestly, for PowerPoints, I got halfway through the semester with pretty image-heavy PowerPoints without needing to um, buy an account. So that's, that's pretty good. I actually, I do pay for it now um, for certain reasons. So for more than 30 people to participate at a time, you do need to pay for the account. And the first time I use this, I taught a class of 32 with those people that are like, please let me in your class. And I was like, OK. And then, then I had to pay for this. But that's OK. It's worth it. Um, and also to have more storage. And I feel good about this because I think it's worth it and because the cost is not transferred to the students, which is something I was thinking about um, with Top Hat. It was $25 a semester. And for me, I didn't have a large lecture. I wasn't using it enough. Um, but I felt like I should ask the students to pay for Nearpod for $10 a month. I will take that cost. <laughs> so these are the three ways that I've used Nearpod. Um, a discussion-based class with 32 people, hands-on production class, 18 people said moving around, setting up lights and camera, and then hands-on editing lab, which took place in a computer lab. So for the first two, it was a live session, which is what this is. <coughs> As I'm advancing the slides, you're seeing the slides advance um, on your devices. Um, and then the third one was a student-paced session. I'll talk about that when we get there. And my results, um, honestly, with the discussion-based class, I left thinking, this is OK. It's OK. It's what we're doing now. All right. It's OK. Um, Hands-on production class, I felt was a big success. It was much more helpful to me when we were moving around the, the space. And we could have the presentation um, while we're also you know, setting up camera. And I could pull up things on the phone. It was, it was much more helpful. And the editing lab, um, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> I feel a little bit iffy about this, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you why um, in a moment. So first, the discussion-based class, it was called mobile media. I thought because we were studying mobile media, we should be using the mobile media. Um, there were 32 students enrolled. Um, here are my thoughts. I prefer it to Twitter. I've been using Twitter before. I found Twitter to be, especially now, more distracting. Um, and if we were still using phones to engage, it's not as um, it's not as public. So for this content, and we use both, um, but I appreciated um, a sort of a more private conversation during class. <laughs> um, it helped avoid a total tech tech fail tech fail. Um, two days the projector didn't work, and the first one um, it was just I had a really um, PowerPoint image heavy presentation on the. Um, the history of mobile media and of mobile technology and some things I can sort of wing, like I can like guide you around the camera very easily. I don't need notes or anything, but for a history lesson, I really needed that. Um, so the projector didn't work, but everyone had the presentation on their phones, and that was that was unexpected but great. Um, it's fun; people love using their phones. I have found um, so that is good news, and it draws shy people into discussion. So if you don't feel like engaging, and there are 32 people, um, you can type. So we were saying about top hat as well. <laughs> Drawbacks. Um, at the end of the semester, I started wondering if it was really worth it or if it was sort of an added on novelty, which is something I think about with technology. Like, when is it really helpful and really like advancing what I'm trying to do in our engagement? And when is it sort of a like, this is cool, let's do this, but it doesn't really add too much. So I was left feeling a little ambivalent. Um, what if someone's battery dies? What if someone doesn't have a device? Uh, accessibility questions and power questions. Potentially distracting because people have their phones out. Um, so a, a few sort of drawbacks. And I left the semester feeling kind of ambivalent. Excited, but also ambivalent. Um, all right. <laughs> Number two, uh, the hands-on studio production class. This is where I feel it was thumbs up, smiley face, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so course information um, it is cross-listed class producing and directing and capstone class for undergrads and then grad TV production is um, a grad class. There are 18 students enrolled, grad and undergrad, and it's a lot of hands-on work. So we meet in the studio and we meet in an editing lab or shooting on location. Um, we go in the classroom, we also are streaming in different venues. It's, we're really moving around a lot. Um, this is an example slide. Um, I did this in New York, it was a camera review. And so I had everyone just look at this picture on their phones. 
And then I didn't actually use the function of Nearpod. I just set it up as I would in PowerPoint. So one plane of the image is in focus, another plane is not in focus. What is this called? Is focus shallow depth of field and wide angle lens? And the answer is shallow depth of field. <laughs> um, and then, you know, here's another question. So what if it's the foreground versus the background? We can keep talking about this. Um, this is another version of the same question, still shallow depth of field. And then I could say, okay, we recognize it, but now how do you as a maker achieve shallow depth of field? Do you open the aperture? Do you close the aperture? And the answer is you open the aperture, and we can look at the diagram. So we did this in sort of a, a PowerPoint type style, but they have it on their phone. We were sitting in a circle, um, so it didn't feel so much like a classroom. Um, and then uh, I gave them some pictures. This is an example of one of the pictures I gave them. So here's some film noir lighting, set this up. And they could have this on their phone, walk around, set up lights. Um, this is from that class. So they're setting up the lights and the microphone and the camera, and they also have this. Um, on their phone, here's my fake rendition of what it felt like, um, that they're doing all this stuff and they had these diagrams. And I could say, okay, well, my background's not going out, we need the shallow depth of field, so let's go back to this chart and I can pull it up on the phone. Um, so at the end of this activity, I felt awesome. Um, I felt really good about using your pod. <laughs> um, benefits it was engaging, it was interactive, um, uh, it was really convenient to be moving around and have this on phones. There were two drawbacks. Um, the first time I did it, just the studio has terrible Wi-Fi, and I was trying to do this from a laptop. Um, and amazing technology, but no wireless signal is like just no. not like <laughs> it's so cool how this works, but we can't get basic Wi-Fi. Um, that was frustrating. And the other drawback is just that people's hands are full. So they're moving around holding lights and cameras and setting all this stuff up. And then they also have to have a phone um, with, this, with any activity. Um, just there was a lot in their hands. But we had 18 people all working together. And so it was, it was fun. Um, all right. So yay, thumbs up. Hashtag awesome. Um, number three, the student paced editing lab. So when you use um, Nearpod, it's very easy to use, especially this. I didn't put a lot of interactivity into this one, so it's really just a PowerPoint, drag and drop, it's almost immediate, um, and then you hit create. That's it. Um, and then I clicked live session, which is when it gave me the code that unfortunately the code looks like a zero and no L was an I, but looks like an L, but oh well, it's still a five digit code, relatively simple. This is a live session. Um, when I click advance or go back, you're seeing it, um, and I'm controlling this, and you can't control it, which I think is both. A good thing and a bad thing. Um, I kind of wish you could, but I also can sort of structure what we're all, we're all seeing the same thing at the same time. Um, good and bad. So student paced the student paced by the student. Um, so the student can go back and forth and choose. So I did this for an editing um, class. We were doing loose activity, <coughs> and I gave them this material. Um, this, these are slides from the presentation I had. So I had it both on Blackboard and in Nearpod. Um, I asked them to use Nearpod, and this is what it looks like um, when they answer questions. So in a way, similar to Top Hat, I see like a list of their names, like a synopsis presentation, but I see a list of their names and who's answered and who hasn't answered. Um, and this is for, yeah, here's my summary, and then this is for the open-ended question. So at the end of this one, I felt interested. Um, the benefits. Uh, there were two different things happening, people could be working with the technology they're working in groups of, most of them had about four people on their teams. Um, so one person could have the phone and do this while another person was on the keyboard. And I feel like it worked for the, the flipped classroom engagement. Um, it definitely kept things structured because they were structured by a presentation. So all of that worked well. Drawbacks, I got started wondering if it's really necessary for the council. Um, the, the students are very, my students in general are very used to Blackboard. Everything is written in Blackboard. And if I can set this up in Blackboard, then it automatically goes to the Grade Center. I'm not sure if I really need Nearpod. Um, so this is something that I've been thinking about. I, I, part of me thinks that it's really awesome and fun um, and helpful. And then another part of me wonders, do I actually need this thing? Um, and we ended up abandoning the interactive assignment about halfway through because the discussions took off and the, the engagements. Um, it sort of got us started, and then once we were physically there, we didn't so much need it anymore. Um, things I'm thinking about accessibility. So, because 
Um, I've always made them with several <coughs> options. I haven't really looked into accessibility, but I do think it's important if I'm going to keep working on this. I want to make sure um, that everything is as accessible um, as it can be, as it needs to be. Um, and another thing I think about is consistency. Oftentimes, I do activities as sort of one-offs. We're going to use this. Okay, we're going to use this um, for this one-time thing. Um, or are we going to use it every week? And the sort of back and forth of that. And for the second two classes, they're sort of exciting one-off activities, um, or two offs or three offs, but not more than three sessions. So it's another thing I think about. All right, so I'm out of time, but here's my summary. Um, would I use it again for production or in physical activity or filming around the city? Yes. Um, structured lab, maybe. Small lecture, no. Large lecture, yes. And mistakes I will not make again, teeny tiny fonts. <laughs> So I asked people to read. I was all like, yes, okay, now what's number, what's letter F? And then I looked at it on their phone. You can't read this at all. Oh, you have it on your phone right now. Does this look awful? You can't, I mean, you cannot read this. Okay. Um, and also, like I said before, um, amazing technology, but no Wi-Fi, like 10,000 spoons and all you need is a knife. This is not, not good. All right. Thank you.